Good morning. I, I really count it an honor and a privilege to be here today for so many reasons, for so many things, for so many times that I thought I would never make it in life. But God saw faithful to place me here for such a time as this, amen? We need to wake up in this place. Is God faithful to you this morning, church? I didn't know if I was going to explode on this front row. They went from hell lost another one to nothing but the blood. And I was about to just come undone right there. Because hell lost another one. And there is nothing but the blood of Jesus that sets man free. Amen. So this morning, I have the opportunity to share with you, this is my story. And I really, I don't think I've shared my story, my testimony in full like this in a very long time. Actually, I think it's been years since I've shared on a platform my story. Not for any reason, just uh, busyness, raising children, you know, just all those things. God has had me in a different season, building God's church and just being here in Florida, which I love so much, and, and to be able to serve you guys. But when I started to pray and I started to ask the Lord, Lord, where do you want me to start? Because how many know there's, there's chapters to our story, right? God isn't finished with writing our story. He, I, just because I'm up here sharing doesn't mean it's one and done. It's not over yet. God is still writing my story. It's beautifully written, and God is going to do that until he calls me home. I'm just excited that I get the opportunity to share with you some awesome truths of how God is faithful and how God redeems and how God sets free and how God is our Savior. And so this morning, I want to share with you a scripture or scriptures, I should say, in connection to my testimony before I share my testimony, because I believe there's power in that. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn with me to John 4, uh, 4 through 10 is where I'm going to read John 4, write it down, read it later, read the whole chapter. I encourage you, I'm only going to take a portion for the sake of time. But I want you to read it. And this is a beautiful story. Some of you already know where I'm at. All I had to say was John 4. You know the woman at the well. You've read about her. You've heard people preach on her. But there's just something that I connect to. And a lot of us in, in, our, in our life, in our walk with God, there's going to be people throughout Scripture. You should always connect to Jesus. But there's going to be other people throughout the Scriptures that you connect to. And this is a woman that I just, for whatever reason, when I met Jesus, Jesus, this is the first book I read was the book of John. And I remember just reading this portion of scripture and just weeping because she was so lost and she was so broken. Yet Jesus met her right where she was at. And I don't know about you, but I've been so lost and I've been so broken. But yet Jesus met me where I was at. Verse number four, it says he had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to a Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said, Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Basically, you are the Savior. And guess what? I am a sinner. But what would you want from me in asking me for a drink? I love this. What Jesus replies to her is the life that he replied to me. It was life to my soul. It was life to my body. He said, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. I love how she responds like, okay, I'm not in the supernatural yet. I'm just kind of still in the natural. So you don't have a rope or a bucket. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides you, besides do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? 
And how can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals in, that his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone. I want you to get this. This is anyone. Did you hear that? It didn't just say Nicole West. It didn't just say Derek West. It didn't just say Marty Cruz. It didn't just say Dale Clayton. It said anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. And it will become fresh, bubbling spring within them from eternal life. Something happens supernaturally when you are desperate for a miracle. There is an overflow that will take place when you walk out of the grave that the enemy has had you in. There's got to be a desperation for something that only Jesus can offer. I love this woman at the well for many reasons, but the main one was that she was desperate. She was desperate to be free from the darkness that surrounded her. She was desperate for love. She was desperate for a relationship. She was desperate for a friend. She was desperate for rest. See, I didn't come here today just to tell you about how bad my life once was. I came here because I'm desperate for an overflow of the spirit. And I don't know about you, but I want you to be just as desperate. No matter what place you are in. See, I didn't come here today without any baggage, I came with some baggage. I came here with some pain. I came here with some rejection. And I came here with some guilt. I came here with some unforgiveness, bitterness, and broken in my life. There has been some things that have happened along my journey that are hard things. But God's grace overpowers every single one of those things. Three things I just want you to take and write down and think about as I tell you my story. The first thing is, is Jesus will meet you right where you are at. The second thing is Jesus will make you an offer you cannot refuse. And the third thing is, is Jesus will always confront the sin in your life. Amen or ouch. But it has to be done because he's working in you a far greater work, right, in glory. Amen? So I was born and raised in upstate New York. Don't hold it against me, all you Floridians. I am what you call, what does is, what is Derek call me? What are, Yankee, okay. See, I like the Yankees, don't hate, don't hate. And so I was raised in a family, um, a big family. Matter of fact, my great-grandmother went home to be with the Lord last night. Guys, 101 years old. She died in her sleep last night. That was the phone call this morning. But guess what? God is still faithful. God knew I was going to share my story, but so did the enemy. But guess what? I'm not staying in that grave. Amen. And so I was born and raised in upstate New York, and my family were pretty big. My great-grandmother had 11 kids, two sets of twins, and they were born, and they had kids, and they had kids. So I was born in a big family. But one of the things that my family battled with at a very young age that I, was, I, known about, I knew about was that they battled with addiction. And so there was alcoholism rampant in my family and drugs. And I may not have knew about the drugs so much as a little child because, of course, I was still innocent and pure in heart. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't think anything of it. Didn't know what weed smelled like or anything like that. But I saw the drinking and the partying and every weekend and, and then just the shots of tequila and the shots and the shots and the shots. And I saw them being promiscuous and going to the bars and riding fast on their Harleys and, and just living this life that I thought, well, they look like they're having fun, right? And so I remember being a young girl and thinking, man, I can't wait till I can have a drink. You know, I just want to have a drink and drink like they're drinking because they look like they're having fun. But there was always something different about me and I always felt different. See, I always felt like I couldn't fit in. Even as a little girl, there was always something. I would try to fit in with the crowds, and I would try to go hang with the cool kids, or I would try to, you know, just fit in. And, and I always felt different. I just I never felt like I could fit into this crowd. 
And I remember my mom just putting a lot on us as little kids because I was the oldest of four. And, and I remember if you're in this room and you're the oldest, you understand what that looks like. You understand that you're a lot of times caring for the younger ones because they are the, your parents aren't living their best life, right? So I was in this drug-infested home because my dad was... My dad was only 17 when my mom got pregnant. He was 18 when I was born. My mom was only 19. And so my parents were babies having babies. And guess what? They didn't know how to be the parents that I needed them to be in my life. But I remember growing up and my dad would be disappear for weeks at a time. And my mom would try to say, well, he's on a business trip because he owned a construction business. And we don't, he, he'll be back. Really, he was out binging on crack cocaine and because he was smoking crack he couldn't be at home because who wants to be at home with their kids and family when they're smoking crack and so he would be gone and he would be living this life that was just you know foreign to me I didn't know what it was but I just knew it hurt my mom and my mom didn't know how to be a mom so she would take us to go spy on my dad and I'd be a little girl and she would gather us in the middle of the night wake us up put her in our jammies and she would put us in a car and she would drive us to, to a bar. And we would sit outside the bar and my mom would sit in the car and wait for my dad to come out. And he would always come out with some other woman. And my mom would never get out of the car. But she would cry and she would sob to us kids. And this is where the first part of my life that I could just know the dysfunction because we were little kids and I would look and I was the oldest and I would just rub my mom's hair and I would just tell her mommy it's going to be all right it's going to be all right because I didn't understand what was really going on I just knew it was wrong and so I for whatever reason started to say I will never never say never guys the enemy hears that but I would say never will I ever drink or use drugs in my life. Never, mom. And she'd look at me and she'd say, promise me, Nikki, promise me you'll never do drugs, please. Don't any of you kids do drugs. It destroys families. And so at 12 years old, I remember finally things started to come out and we started to hear my dad was smoking crack and still at 12, that's very much a shock. I mean, it's, a, it's like a murder. Like you don't even know what to feel. You're like, I don't even have any you know, feeling right now, I don't know what to think, but he would smoke weed in the garage and he would have like pounds of weed in his drawer. And I remember being a kid and we would pull this drawer open and there would be like all this weed and we just like look at these pipes and all this stuff and we wouldn't know what to do with it, obviously, but we would just look at it and be like, whoa, my dad's like cartel. You know what I mean? Like I just started to feel like he was some, like into something more than what we could even I didn't know. I was like, oh my gosh, should we shut the door, drawer? And then at 12 years old, my mom says, we got to go visit your dad. And we didn't know where we were going. And so we walked into this facility and this facility was a treatment center. And I remember meeting this counselor at the front door, this 12 year old girl walking with this counselor. And all the way back to where my dad was, she kept saying, this is not really your dad. This is a disease. And this is what destroys people. He loves you kids. And he has asked for you every day. And so please hang on and hold tight and be strong for your younger siblings. Be strong. I remember hearing that. Be strong for your younger siblings. So there was something inside of me that rose up and had to, to wipe away the tears and walk into this room. And I remember I sat across from him and we talked and he told us for the first time that he was an addict. And I remember I went to leave the place and we, we sobbed all the way out. You guys, some of you know what I'm saying. We thought we were leaving our dad there forever. You could, it's like for the first time in my life that I felt the spirit of rejection. And so I was like, my daddy can't even be the dad that he's called to be in my life. What do I have? I don't have a father. And I felt for the first time in my life I was fatherless. 
And so I started to walk down this journey. And at 13 and 14 years old, I started to dip and dab and do a few things. Once my friends offered me some marijuana, I was like, you know what? Yeah, let me hit that. I hit it. I got violently sick. I puked in my purse at a bar and I had to have friends clean it out. So yeah, it wasn't a pretty time for me. I got very sick off of it. You'd think it would have stopped there, but it didn't. I kept doing it and I kept doing it until it, guess what? I didn't get sick from it no more. Guess what? I started needing it every day. By 15 years old, I was with someone that was much older than me by seven years because guess what? Church, I started looking for a father figure. I started looking for a man to be like a father in my life. And guess what? I couldn't mess around with the 15-year-old boys in my life. I needed to go for the boys that had the car, that were doing something with their life, that wanted to, to be a dad in my life. Sick as it sounds, church, that is what it led me to. And then before you know it, I got down this path and I was starting to take pain medicine, which was the next thing, opiates. And I could take them and go to school and function and whatnot. But then all of a sudden, cocaine was offered to me. I, I want to say that one thing was my drug of choice, but there wasn't one. I did whatever was offered to me. If it got me high and it took me from where I was at, and it erased all my childhood memories of things that happened to me as a little girl, all those things that I walked through, then I would just do it. And I didn't care about the consequences. By 18 years old, I was in a house, a trap house, with some people, and we were doing some cocaine for a few days. We had been up for a few days. We'd been partying, and you think nobody notices. You think nobody knows you coming in and out of the house for three days straight, a bunch of people. Well, guess what? Cops called, and all of a sudden, the cops were coming in through the bottom door, and, and we were throwing coke out the top window, and it landed right in the cop's lap, pretty much, like right in his lap. And so, dumb, 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 but because we were scared, because I'm like, I'm not getting caught with it, and so all of a sudden, you know, we're throwing it out the window right into his hand. He could have caught it. He was like, what in the world? He walks up the stairs with it. Every one of us gets arrested. My first time getting arrested for uh, possession of cocaine. And so then I, I started to keep spiraling down this spiraling thing. But one thing I can tell you is I never, ever filled the void that I was trying to fill. Nothing I kept chasing then I kept chasing. It was like every day I was chasing it, chasing it. And before you know it, I was, I was into this life. My husband laughs and he says, my wife used to follow the Grateful Dead. I, they were, Jerry Garcia was not alive at this time, okay? Jerry had already died, so it was who was left of the dead. And I was a hippie. I did have dreadlocks. I did roll with patchwork clothes on. I made my own clothes. I didn't wear any makeup. I traveled. I did shave my legs. Don't judge me. People ask me that all the time. I, I, there was still some things in my life that I need. But I found family. That's the thing. I was looking for that, to fill that void in a family. And what happened is the hippies back then was like a move, it's a movement. It's where people are like, love everybody, you're my family type of feel. And so I fell into a trap. Well, I got introduced to heroin. And when I tell you something, it's when my, I gave my soul away. I thought I had done that the first drug that I used. But at that minute, I sold myself. I sold my soul to the devil. But God. And so I started to get really out of control if that wasn't already out of control. I mean, I get pretty worse uh, out of control. But I, I started traveling around to these festivals and I was selling drugs and I was doing all these things to make mine, and you understand if you're in that life, I may be speaking a language you don't understand, but please follow along. And so I had to do some things, I hustled. I ended up doing things that I wasn't proud of, giving myself away as a woman. But I, uh, nonetheless, I gave, I, I was getting high every single day, and then I, I got to this festival one time, and this festival was in the middle of nowhere, guys, and check this. I know, I'm getting tripped up here. 
I got to this festival and there was this whole field of people, okay? And I remember walking in and I had taken some really strong stuff and I was like really tripping out at this point. And I remember I just was like, oh my gosh, I'm on a mission, I'm on a mission. I always felt this call calling me. I always felt like somebody was there talking to me. I always asked other people, do you believe in God? I don't know why I was asking this question. I know now why I was asking this question. But at that time, I didn't know why I was asking this question. But I would start talking about God. I'd be higher than a kite. They'd be higher than Cooter Joe. And all of a sudden, they would be like, are you, why are you mentioning God, girl? Take that God stuff out of here. We're not in that. Why are you talking about God? And I'd be like, do you believe in God? Do you believe in something bigger than you? How do you think we got here? And if they told me they didn't believe in God, I was like, I can't hang with you. Even though I'm high and on drugs and a mess, I'm like, I can't hang with you. You're crazy. You're weird. Like, I can't hang with you. And they're like, and you are doing, what? Like, what? They didn't understand, but there was this call on my life. And so I would be talking about God because I'd be this close to death. Jesus has a way in knocking at your door when you're this close to death. And I'd be thinking about him, even though I couldn't get myself sober. Just like this woman at the well, when she was walking her journey, she was going there at the hottest time of the day, the heat of the day, the worst time of her life. She was broken. She was trying to run. I was trying to run. We were running from something. We were going to go run as hard as we could, as fast as we could, away from people. She was rejected. She was ostracized. She was considered unclean. She was considered unworthy. She felt unloved. She felt all these things. And that is exactly the place that I was in. But you guess what? Jesus will go out of his way. Way to meet you right where you're at no matter how lost you are and so I remember I was at this festival and I started selling drugs and all of a sudden I sold this to this guy and, and the, the thing is is my guy that was with me was trying to rip him off he was trying to sell him some drugs for more than what they were worth. And I was like, nah, dude. I turned just like this, said, nah, dude, give it to him for this. And what happened is I negotiated a deal, and it was an undercover we were dealing with. I'm trying to give the undercover a D, okay? <laughs> and he was not feeling that I was trying to give him a deal, but that's all right. He laughed because he thought it was kind of funny because I was, he was an undercover and I was getting mad at We were about to fight because he was trying to rip him off. And I was like, you can't rip him off. Give him to it for this. Well, I negotiated a deal by running my mouth. Ain't I good at running my mouth? Some of y'all know me up in here. I'm real good at running my mouth. And so I went to walk out. See, the thing about cops is I love them today. I love them today. Come on, let's give a round of applause for the officers. <laughs> They are only doing their job and they're used by God. So don't hate. They had to wait until I walked off the premises of this private property that this festival was on. So I negotiated the deal on the premises and then they waited for me to walk out outside the, the thing. And all of a sudden this car comes unmarked this way, another one comes this way, and another one comes this way. And guess what, there ain't nowhere to go. And so, and I'm too high to run. So I was like, you know what? I stopped and they said, put your hands behind your back. And I said, what did I do? I'm still, what did I do? What did I do? Come on, RJ, you know what I'm talking about. What did I do? What did I do? And they're like, what did you do? You just sold us acid. And I was like, no, I didn't. I never touched it. I know officers in here. I was like, I never touched it. He said, no, you didn't, but you ran your mouth and you got yourself a felony charge because of it. All right. I didn't have nothing on me. But the problem was, guys, is I was far from home. And this was a country jail. They arrested me and took me in and they set bail at $3,000. My dad ended up coming. Thank God for dad. He understood where I was at. He came and he bailed me out. He's like, you know, you know. 
thank God someone did it for me. I'm going to do it for you. He wasn't helping me, church. He bailed me out at $3,000. I ran. I ran as fast as I could. I hopped on tour with who was left of the Grateful Dead. And I'm going to rush through this next part because I want to get to the best part. And so I ran as fast as I could. I kept using all the way. I went from New York all the way to Florida. I went from Florida out to California. Because if you know anything about hippies and getting on tour and following after the dead, your main goal is to get to California. Okay, San Francisco, California, where the New Year's show is going to be. You want to hop on tour. You want to get to this place. This is what hippies live for. And so I'm like, I'm going to get there. I've never been. I want to go. I want to see Hate and Ashbury. I want to, I want to do this thing. I'm filling this void. And so I got out there and I remember I sold, I ripped off um, some Mexicans, which you don't do that. That's very bad. Don't ever do that. And so all of a sudden I'm, I, I ripped them off because guess what? I'm still trying to get high guys. Can't high. I'm running out, running out, but God knew it. And all of a sudden I'm on this bus and all, these missions missionaries are sitting on the bus and they and they look across the bus and I don't know what it was about me why everybody on that bus these missionaries thought I'm gonna talk to her because I was not the one looking like you should be the one talking to I had dreadlocks I was in patchwork clothes I looked like a real hippie mess and so I was sitting there and they came across and they sat in front of me and they introduced themselves as missionaries and I cannot for the life of me remember from where because guess what, I didn't care. I didn't care. And so then they start telling me about Jesus and they said, do you know Jesus? I said, no, I don't. He don't want to know me. And I, I was like, you're, I'm not the one. And so he, they said, no, you're exactly who he wants to know. And I said, I'm not in a place to receive. You see, I've done a lot of bad things I've hurt people. I said, I'm running right now. I'm, I'm in trouble. I don't know why I was telling them all these things. But the Spirit of God knows why I was telling them all these things. And so they gave me their card, and they're like, if you ever need anybody to talk to, just give us a call. And so then I just, I, I left it at that. I threw the card in the garbage, of course. I got off the bus. I was like, yeah, I ain't for that. And so then I, I, I started to run. And then these guys were looking for me and they were going to kill me. Listen, church, I believe with everything in me that they, I would have been just a girl lost. That you would have never saw me again. I was in a place I didn't know. They were looking for me. So I called my mom one last time. How many of you called your mom? How many times in your addiction? And guess what? My mom, this one last time, she picks up. And I said, Mom, I need, I need some money to get out of bus and come back from California to New York. She says, Nikki, I can't give you no more money. I can't help you. I, I've buried you already three times. I have buried you already in my mind and in my heart. I've let you go, Nikki. I can't help you no more. This is not a game. You can't keep playing with me. And I said, Mom, I'm not playing this time. Please hear me, Mom. Is your daughter. I need your help. I need help. I'm sick. I'm on drugs. I am messed up. I want to come home. I want to turn myself in. I want to get right with God. I want to do all these things and even though I didn't know what that meant I knew I had an aunt that was praying for me this whole time and she was a praying aunt and she not just a praying aunt man she was calling call it out of you aunt. and she would just start telling me all about God whether I wanted to hear I'd be covering my ears trying to walk away and she'd be right behind me praying girl you gotta get saved girl you gotta get saved girl And I remember my mom said to me at this time, she said, Nikki, I'm going to send you $100. <sighs> I'm going to pay for the bus ticket, and, I, and you better come home. Well, I went all the way three days dope sick. I, if anybody knows what that is, that's terrible, on a bus, and that's three days. And so I got home, and I, I, I want to say I ran right in and did the right thing. I didn't, but you know what? Sometimes God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And so I ran to my uncles, who I knew got high, but guess what? In the meantime, he had gotten sober, and he had given his heart to Christ. I didn't know it, and I ran to his house, and he, I said, I need $40 because I needed to catch my the dude across the street at the McDonald's and he's like I'm a I can't help you Nikki and he kept saying no and finally I begged him to a place where he just said here and he gave me the $40 and I walked out the door he called the detectives as I walked out the door to cross the street I did get the dope and I did get high in the bathroom and I walked out of the, the McDonald's bathroom and there the detectives were standing waiting on me when I came out and they said are you tired of running And I said, I'm tired. They said, give us what you got. 
We're going to throw it away. We won't charge you with it. But if you do take it with you into the jail, you're in big trouble. Girl, you're going away for at least five years. And I said, I'm tired. I'm tired. I need to go. I want my life back. And they talked to me the whole way about how I got to this place, when in my life that this happened. And I just kept telling them my testimony. I didn't, I didn't know God at the time, but I kept telling them my testimony. And they were getting tears in their eyes, these detectives, as they're driving me to prison. And so I go to jail, and that is where God, guess what? I walked into this little jail. It was the, I was the only girl in there. And, and, it, and I walked in, and they said, three days later, they're like, do you want to go to Bible study? A lot happens in three days, doesn't it, guys? Three days I said, I want to go. Does it get me out of my cell? They're like, yeah. I said, I I'm going, I'm going. Is it, where does it get me? Where do I go? And they're like, you're going to go down to this room, and you, you're the only girl in this little county jail because I was going to be transferred from this place. And the lady don't have to come, but she'll come for you, the CO says, because she said she felt like she needed to. And so I walked into that room that day, and I'm not kidding you, this woman stood about this high, this little filled with the spirit woman stood about this high and I remember me and her made eye contact when I walked through the door and there's something about favor guys see favor will bring you to places that you don't deserve to be see God favor will put you in positions that you didn't deserve to have see favor will bring you before people great men and great women that God that the world would say you should never even be connected to and this woman prayed over me that day and I gave my heart to Jesus in this little county cell. And I wept and I cried and I walked out of there and I went into my room and she told me to read the book of John and I read the book of John from front to back, back to front and I cried and I asked the Lord, I said, if you'll just give me a chance and get me out of this place, don't we all when we're in jail, if you just get me out of this place, I'll do what you have asked me to do. And guess what? God made a way for me after being denied pro uh, f uh, drug court for a few times. They finally came in and offered me drug court. I got out of there. I went into a treatment for two months and then I went into a halfway house for 13 months. I did drug court. I did a year, uh, two and a half years of probation. But in the meantime, when I was getting ready to leave the treatment, I had a little lady who distributed the meds at the window and this is how God works. The only counselor in the place that was a Christian was my counselor because God has a way of putting you in places that, that the enemy could would never open up for you. And I remember I went to this window one day and she looked at me and she goes, I think you need to meet somebody. And I said, who's that? And she said, you gotta go over to this Pentecostal church, this Assembly of God church. There's this pastor there all the way from Wildwood, Florida. His name is Pastor Derek West. And I was like, I was like, from Florida? All right. I was like, well, what's he? And she goes, and he is handsome. I'll tell you right now. She was like in her 60s, so I'll bless her heart. But she said, he's handsome, and he is on fire for God. And Nicole, I had a dream. I had a dream. He's going to be your husband. And I don't know what this means to you. I'm like a pastor. What? I was like, you crazy. Girl, if you've been taking the meds in there, you better come up out there and stop taking other people's meds. I think you've been tapping into some of them. And she's like, no, I'm serious, Nicole. I was woken up by the Spirit of God. And she said, I know you're not, haven't been to a Pentecostal church, but I'm telling you right now, Nicole, I know the dream was from God. And so I was like, all right, fine. And so long story, I went, I went for the first time, and I remember I walked to the front of the door, and there stands Mr. West. And he, I was not there for that. <laughs> but when you know it's your husband, you know. And so I went and I said, I introduced myself. He introduced himself. And there was a connection right there from the doorway into the church. But what happened is I went in and I sat down and he preached his testimony that day. And I remember hearing his story of how God can set you free 
how he can set you free, free indeed. He can deliver you from drugs. He can deliver you from gangs. He can deliver you from the darkness. He can deliver you from the bondage. He can set you free. Not only does he set you free, but he places you on a rock that cannot be moved, and he gives you a purpose, and he calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light, and he gives you a story, and he gives you a a place to worship. And from that moment on, Derek and I, we became good friends first because we wanted to keep it godly. Amen. And so we want, and he looked at me and he said, if I fall, I will leave and you'll never see me again. It's not like it, it was back where we're from, Nicole. See, we can't be doing what we used to do. And you and I, we've been around. We don't need that. We need Jesus because we will die. We need Jesus or I will die. And so he said, I love him more. You need to love him more, girl. And so I said, I love you more, Jesus. I laid down everything. He laid down everything, and we started to travel together. We ended up getting married. We have three beautiful children, and God has blessed us. But church, out of all that story, and I know that was long, but Pastor Dale, I can't help it. I just felt like the Spirit needed to lead us this way. And I just know that God has a plan and a purpose, not just for my life, but for yours as well. Please stand with me worship team see Derek and I ended up traveling as evangelists for a while and we we got back to the place where I got arrested at thank you to the officers that day and we were having a really bad drive because you know how, how the enemy still attacks right he'll attack your marriage He'll still fight you every inch of the way. He ain't, he ain't listen. He ain't just going to let you do what you, God's called you to do. And so we were arguing pretty bad. And Derek would share this story, so I'm upset. And Garmin ended up getting smashed, okay, because Garmin was trying to take us into millions of different directions. And if you know my husband, especially before, way back then, that Garmin went bye-bye that day. Go bye-bye, Garmin. Now we're on our own. And so... We drove by where I got busted, and I looked over, and I said, oh, my. I go, there's where the end of my old life. And the begin Derek, there's where I got. And I'm not kidding you. We looked up, and the road that I got busted on was West Road. There's your son, right? I just got done telling God, I don't know if he's the one. If you were with us this last weekend and we were at the women's conference and she said for 18 years, she said, I don't need a man. And then after 18 years, she woke up and didn't have one. Well, that was me at that moment. I was like, I don't need a man. Is he really the one? And we'll always question God. But that right there was like God said, don't question me again. I have a plan. And the enemy's going to fight you guys. Come hell or hot water, that enemy is going to fight you every step of the way because look at how many souls are sitting in this room. Look at how many people have come to know Jesus Christ, not because of anything Derek and I have done, but because of the power of the living God that's flowing through us. Because Derek and I, one day, we chose to drink of the living water. We stopped drinking from the well that was dry, empty, and stagnant, and we started drinking from the living water. We took Jesus up on the gift that we we couldn't refuse. God, we started walking in the fullness of our destiny. We started preaching that God saves, sets free, and delivers. We started telling everybody about our testimony. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't exempt you. God says your gift will make room for you. And it will bring you before great men and great kings. And so church, I don't know where you're at today. But God does. See, here's the thing. The beauty of it is that God knew where you were at. He knew where I was at. And yet he still met us there anyway. See, God still went out of his way to meet you and I where we're at. He's not just done with you. 
He hasn't finished the story he's writing just because he's blessed you or maybe did a miracle in your life once before doesn't mean he's done with you now. I'm just, I love that about Jesus, Benny. It's no matter how many times you fall, God says he will get you up again. It says, though the godly may fall seven times, they will get up again. And so I want to give a salvation call. Maybe you're in this place. I don't want to ever preach my story without doing that because thank God that lady met with me, the only girl in this jail. She came and she met with me and she knows I'm a pastor's wife. She's called me years down the road and she said, I could just go home and be with Jesus. Nicole, I knew something was special about you. But God said, she's mine. It's God who stamped me. It was God who said, she's my daughter. She never was intended to be lost in this world. She is not fatherless. She is redeemed. She has a father who's loved her. I've never stopped loving her. I've been with her every inch of the way. The nights that she may have stopped breathing in her sleep from the drugs, I breathe life into her. Because that is not her story. My story is his redeemer. If you don't know Jesus, please lift up your hand in this place if you want to know Jesus today. If you want Jesus in your heart, this same God that set me free.